So today, what I'd like to do, we're, we're turning the corner in our series on marriage. I've enjoyed uh, uh, presenting this. I've enjoyed uh, the, the research, the, the personal challenge of kind of looking at my own marriage and praying for people and their marriages and all that stuff. It's been a wonderful part of the series. I've enjoyed going through it. But to ignore what we're calling the elephants in the room, there's lots of issues surrounding this, and we're not even going to touch on all of them, but we're going to try deliberately to touch on some of the challenging issues that surround relationships, marriage, the redefinition of marriage, sexuality. There's a lot of things that are sort of challenging. And so we're kind of shifting gears. We're going to talk about the elephants in the room. The the message that we're looking at today is called The Gospel and the Sexual Atheist. And uh, our tagline actually begins with a question, and this is the main thing that I'd like us to try to start to get our hands around today. How should the church respond to a changing sexual ethic? And um, so that's what we're going to do. Sounds like a lot of fun, I hope. You know what I mean? We're going we're gonna to dig into it. I'm nursing a little bit of a cold, so if I have to pause every now and then to drink my favorite tea, I said in the first service, if there's ever a message that you need to take some pauses and breaths, it might be this one. And uh, I'll, be, I'll be drinking my very favorite kind of tea, which you all know, chamomile, right? <laughs> that's good. Um, so anyway, that's happening today. Let's begin, uh, I'd actually like to, to pray for us. Uh, I know Ed just, just prayed, but let's pray for just a moment. We'll ask, ask the Lord to help us as we get into this together. Father, thanks for your word to us. Thank you, God, for your deep desire to stir things up in us, and I pray that you would do that today. And I pray, Father, in the name of Jesus and in his authority, that the words that are shared here would be effective for building up the body of Christ, that you would bring things to light, God, that you want to to not remain in the darkness. And Father, I pray very specifically that the, the implications of this message and messages like this would have a ripple effect that would reach down through generations, that would change the trajectory and the legacy that we leave behind, and that would ultimately ripple very much into eternity. Lord, we ask that for you because you're our big God and there's nothing too small for you. And we ask it in the strong name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. All right, so for a few words of introduction, Oswald Chambers asks a great question. He says, have you ever heard the master, that is Jesus, say something very difficult for you? If you haven't, I question whether you have ever heard him say anything at all. He goes on to say that Jesus did all kinds of stirring of things. He didn't mind disturbing the peace, and he would frequently, listen to this, awaken people from their self-satisfied spiritual lull. May God do that this morning. And so as we jump in, I want to acknowledge first and foremost that some of the topics that we're talking about today and in the coming weeks, admittedly, some of those topics are a little bit tough. I want to acknowledge that addressing some of the elephants in the room might mean, and I think it probably will mean, that some toes will be stepped on in the process. I want to acknowledge that as well. I want to also acknowledge that the implications of a message like this and the ones that will follow are simultaneously hard and glorious. So if we can kind of acknowledge all of those pieces together and wrestle with it, I think we can jump in. Our primary scripture for today comes from the Gospel of John in the fourth chapter. If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to flip over there. Uh, Although we're going to do a little bit of setting up of this scripture in a way that I think will help us identify some key pieces. Um, Before we ask for the biblical answer, let's try to at least get our mind around what is the question that we're asking. So the title of the message today is The Gospel and the Sexual Atheist. I'm going to give a little bit of explanation on that as the message unfolds, but in essence, it serves as a commentary on both what I feel is the challenge of our day and the solutions for the questions that we're asking. The specific question that we'll look at in today's message is, how should the church respond to a changing sexual ethic? That's a great question, I think, for us to kind of grapple with today. Well, John 4 begins with Jesus. He's taking a break, all right? Uh, He's traveling through Samaria on his way to Galilee, and he stops in the town of Sychar at a very historical spot known as Jacob's Well. And he's tired. It's midday. It's probably hot. And he decides he's going to take a break. 
That's, that's kind of the context for the conversation that will unfold in this chapter. And the reason that I've sort of chosen that and really sense the Lord's leading us in that in this week is that it gives us an opportunity to look at a conversation. Jesus is having a conversation, and there's a little bit of a spoiler alert here, with a woman that I think we could agree is not upholding sort of a traditional biblical sexual ethic. That's not really a big deal, I think, to us. It shouldn't be a big deal at all. I think what's, what's a great opportunity is we get to see how does Jesus engage with that? Because if we want to be followers after him, if we want to be disciples of his, we look at how he does things, I think a lot of times it can give us some wonderful insight. So Jesus is sitting down, he's having this break, and we get, begin to see this conversation about Jesus and a woman who is not upholding a traditional biblical sexual ethic. Now, before we look at the text, I think it might be important for us to say, well, if we're going to throw things around like a traditional biblical sexual ethic, what does that even mean? What are we referring to when we say that? So I'm going to give just a really brief kind of overview, a couple basic tenets of what we're referring to that. If you look scripturally, here's a couple things that I think you would find as you study. Number one, sex is a beautiful gift and it is intended to be shared, but in the context of marriage. That would be a basic biblical tenet about sexuality. Uh, Again, just so you understand, in the context of this, I'm not asking you to agree with this. I'm not asking you necessarily even to subscribe to this. I'm just asking us to be able to understand it as we get started. Number two, sex is given in a context, the context of marriage, as an expression of intimacy or bonding And it gives potential for childbearing. So you actually have bonding husband and wife, but then with the potential for childbearing, you actually have an intergenerational bonding, which again is sort of significant and shows some of the weight and the beauty of the sexual ethic as promoted in the Bible. So you've got some of these very high uh, elevated things, but then you also have some clear restrictions, very clear restrictions if you look at the Bible. Uh, There are some no-nos given under the label of um, uh, adultery, which is a violation of the marriage covenant. And the other big one would be sort of typically or historically translated fornication. Uh, This is a broader term that it would encompass adultery, among other things, uh, and is also translated as sexual immorality. So you've got this elevated sense of like what sex is, also some prohibitions of where it shouldn't go or where it doesn't belong. This is a basic traditional sexual ethic. Now, as we dig into it, there's also some implied restrictions about it. So we see, and we could sort of expound on probably a lot of these, a list that could be given as, but not limited to, uh, topics like pornography, which is not mentioned deliberately uh, in the Bible, but certainly we could extrapolate some different pieces and say, okay, Jesus said don't look lustfully at a woman because that's like uh, committing adultery in your heart. So we can see some application there. Pornography, cohabitation, we're actually going to talk about that a little bit today. Uh, is it a big deal to, to live with somebody if I'm not married to them or have a sexual relationship in that regard? Uh, we're going to chat about that again, stepping possibly on some toes. Uh, and probably several other topics uh, that, that we could look at. I, I found it kind of interesting, you know, if you grew up in the church, especially an evangelical church, your parents probably reminded you of things like this, like you need to even avoid the appearance of evil. How many of you loved that as a teenager? Like, what? I'd only have to like do the right things and follow the right, I gotta like make sure I don't even look like I'm doing the wrong things. You know what I mean? And that's actually a scriptural thing too. So we have this idea of an elevated view of sex, but also there are restrictions that are there. Uh, that is, that is a, an overview of a biblical um, idea or tenets of sexuality. So uh, we're also, we also come away with some, some fairly clear scriptures that support what I'm, I'm sharing here. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6.18, I'm just going to look at these real quickly. If you're taking notes, you can jot these down. They're not our primary text for today. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6.18 says, Flee sexual immorality. Uh, All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 to 5, it is God's will that you should be sanctified. Sanctified means set apart for God. And then the very first thing on the list after that, that you should avoid sexual immorality. That each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God. Uh, Hebrews 13.4, I think is another good just sort of grounding verse for us. It says, uh, marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure for God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. So there we get this sort of two key words that we talked about in our restrictions a minute ago. So that gives us an overview of kind of a a biblical sexual ethic uh, traditionally viewed. 
Um, I'd like to compare that um, with what I would simply call sort of a, a, a sexual ethic from a cultural or modern standpoint. So while we often speak of the reality of the tension between freedom and holiness, freedom in Christ, meaning that I don't have to rely on my own track record, but I can fall on his finished work, but then as I pursue holiness, I'm actually embracing a deeper freedom through restraint. It's sort of a tension that we wrestle with, and I think we wrestle with it in the area of sexuality, maybe one of the highest places that that tension comes to bear. Uh, so while we're wrestling with that tension in here, in the ecclesia, ecclesia is the, is the Greek word that, means, that we translate as church, but it essentially means the called out ones, okay? If, if you can just sort of take a mental note of that, I think if we can understand this identity that if you are in Christ, it doesn't matter what church you attend, what building you're in, if you're part of the ecclesia or the called out ones, we are called to wrestle with certain things in here, and we see a contrast out there. So when we say in here, out there, that's what we're talking about. Does that make sense? Okay, so we're wrestling with that as the ecclesia. While we do that, we wrestle with that in here, the culture out there takes a very different approach toward an ethic regarding sexuality. So sexual ethic from a cultural or modern perspective kind of says this, if the, if the Christian ethic promotes freedom through restraint, then the culture promotes freedom quote unquote, without any restraint. And we've done a pretty good job of that. I mean, it's a pretty compelling promise that you can do what you want. You're entitled to your body. You do what you want with it. You only live once, so kind of go nuts. One of my favorite quotes that I think is that sort of encapsulates it very well and uh, almost put Chad Oberholzer on the floor because he laughed so hard when I shared it with some of the staff comes from Miss, Mrs. Patrick Campbell, who was way ahead of her time. She was a British actress in the late 1800s and the 1940s. She for, sort of famously said, does it really matter what these affectionate people do so long as they don't do it in the streets and don't frighten the horses. You know, I think it's actually a pretty good like encapsulation of a modern or secular view of, of sexuality. You just, you sort of do what you want. It's your business. You don't mess. So we can kind of see the contrast. Does that make sense? You know, it's not hard to see. I think that a, a modern or secular view message, uh, there's not really anything new here, but certainly in our cultural mood, this approach to sexuality is very well established. I mean, you see this kind of everywhere you look, right? In culture, arts, movies, music, other forms of entertainment. I mean, literally, I mean, if you want to do an experiment, just first, like, watch no TV for, like, a month, okay? And then just start turning on the TV and just randomly watching. I mean, you'll be amazed at what you see and what you've kind of conditioned yourself to see. Uh, flip through, uh, you know, the hip-hop radio uh, and just listen to ten songs. Like, nine of them will be about sex. So it's very well ingrained in terms of, like, what we see. So we kind of understand this, this, uh, this uh, difference. Okay. So one of the questions that the, that the culture outside of the ecclesia is asking, and I think it's a valid question, is why is the church so uptight when it comes to sexuality? Why are we sort of up in everybody's business and, you know, that kind of stuff? Um, and, and I think that's a valid question that our, our world is asking, and I hope we can address that a little bit today as we go through this. So anyway, that's a long setup, but I think it gives us a little bit of an understanding of where we are. Now we have Jesus sitting down to engage in this conversation. I'd like to actually make five uh, observations about it today, but let's go ahead and read a little bit in John chapter 4, and we'll make our way through. So John chapter 4, let's pick up in verse 7. Uh, Jesus has been resting, and, and we've gone through that setup. And then when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you, uh, he, would have, he would have given you living water. Uh, so I, I want to pause there for a minute and I want to look at five observations. Don't get too excited because the first one is really a pretty fast one. Uh, some of the other ones are a little bit more involved, so just hang in there with me as we go. Observation number one is the importance of mission. Uh, with this whole dialogue and this whole kind of question of where do we engage and what do we not engage and how do we as the ecclesia or the occult or the called out ones engage with a culture that has a different kind of sexual ethic, okay, let's look at Jesus. The importance of mission. Without hesitation, Jesus crosses barriers, like immediately. 
Here we see gender, culture, and begins to take the gospel conversation into places where it would not naturally be expected to go. So observation number one is just the importance of Jesus on mission. It's fascinating because the woman says to him, why are you talking to me? (laughs) Why are you engaged? Like, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan, you're a man, I'm a woman. That is not normally done in this way. And yet Jesus doesn't have any problem crossing the cultural barriers of saying, I want to bring the gospel conversation into a place where it would not naturally go. I think that gives us really kind of a significant clue on the front end of this question. Because the question I would ask you as the ecclesia, for those of you who are in Christ, those of you who have made your commitment to Jesus and you're walking with him, what are the cultural barriers that you look at and say, I would not go there? I don't want to go there. I don't want to talk to that person. They're different than me or they value something different. And we see Jesus sort of immediately gravitating and crossing those cultural barriers. So it's an observation for us as a church. I think it's good for us to see that. That was pretty painless, right? Observation number one. Check it off. We're done. Uh, Let's continue going on in John chapter 4. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with. The well is deep. Where can you get get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? So they're beginning to have sort of a spiritually minded conversation. Jesus says in verse 13, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I will give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And now she's kind of intrigued. Verse 15, the woman says to him, sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. So she doesn't fully understand what he's talking about, but she's kind of intrigued about it. The second observation is a, is a lesson for the church, is a lesson for the ecclesia, for, for, for those of us who would say, I'm in Christ, I'm called out of culture and called out to holiness and to be with him. Here's the lesson for us. Jesus assumes Because he knows her life, right? I mean, he's going to reveal that in a few minutes. You know, the whole five husbands and you're living with a guy that's not your husband. He knows that. But Jesus assumes, I think we can rightly say this, that her attitude and her actions towards sexuality are symptoms of a deeper need in her life. See, he's like, he's, he's deducing something very proper here. He's understanding there's a search for significance There's a search for intimacy. There's a search for transcendence, something other, something greater. There's a search for meaning. And listen, if you don't see that in the culture around you, open your eyes. The the issues are not new. The heart needs are not new. The ways that we manage to hurt ourselves in the process, yes, we've probably developed some better methods for doing that. But the issues are all one and the same. This is an important lesson for the church. Here's our savior. Here's our good king looking at this woman realizing that her attitudes towards sex are actually a symptom of something deeper. Jesus does not start with behavior modification. He doesn't say, well... You know, we want to have a spiritual conversation, then we got to get your life straightened out and we got to change your living arrangement. He doesn't start there at all. Jesus, listen to this now Jesus does not expect a godly standard from a secular person. How much time? Do we sort of as Ecclesia church people, we wring our hands, we get all upset, we get worked up about culture not being acting in a godly way. Well, why aren't people acting in a godly way? Because they're not godly people. They don't know Jesus, right? They're, in fact, trying to meet those deep heart needs with the next best thing, and you would too. So Jesus doesn't wring his hands. He doesn't get all upset about a secular person responding in a non-godly way. This is a good lesson for us so that we don't spin our wheels in all kinds of unproductive ways. Now, um, I might suggest to us today that we should not be terribly surprised or undone uh, when we see a secular culture behaving in a secular way. We should be challenged, however, if we want to talk seriously about being the ecclesia and the called out ones. I think we should be really challenged when we see inappropriate behavior in the church. When we see sort of ungodly approaches to sexuality and stuff here, in here, and again, you understand why I'm kind of using that phraseology, uh, I think it should surprise us. I think it should, it should get our attention in a significant way. Uh, there's an uh, author, Kenny Luck, uh, wrote a really fascinating um, article, and it's from that article that I'm pulling the, the phrase, the sexual atheist. Interestingly, 
uh, when Kenny Luck wrote this, he was not referring to people out there. He was referring to the church. He said, you know, we've, he's identifying a challenge or a problem. I'll, I'll illustrate it this way. ChristianMingle.com, you know, it's a Christian dating site. I haven't been there myself, but, you know, if I needed to, I probably would. ChristianMingle.com uh, surveyed uh, all of these people, uh, lots and lots of people, Christian people, self-identifying Christians, saying that, you know, I'm a Christian person. And so uh, amidst the questions, one of them was really very frank. It was this, would you have sex outside of marriage? I mean, you can't get much more like yes or no, black and white. It's a very binary kind of situa- situation. 63% of the respondents, Christians, said, yeah, I would. Now, here's this guy looking at this and saying, well, what's, what's going on? He writes this. He says, it's as if God has nothing to say to them on the subject or consequences, at least anything meaningful, enough to dissuade them from following their own course of conduct. But see, this is a great oxymoron. A person who at once believes in a wise, sovereign, and loving God who created them and all things can also believe simultaneously that God should not, cannot, or will not inform their thinking or living sexually. It reminds me of those famous red letters in Luke's gospel where Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but not do what I say? So there's sort of an oxymoron that we're wrestling with. We shouldn't be surprised that things like, subjects like premarital sex, cohabitation, pornography, all of these issues and their consequences, they are at all-time highs culturally. That shouldn't surprise us. It should get our attention, and it should perplex us, though, when those things show up inside the church. So Jesus gives us a really interesting lesson of understanding what's the most important and not important, and where do we look for it, and how do we respond in everything as he's engaging with her. Let's read verse 16. Uh, This is where it, I think, really starts to get interesting. John chapter 4. Jesus told her, go call your husband and come back. So she's just said, let's talk about this living water thing. And he says, go get your husband. I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands, and the man you have now is not your husband. Um, what What you have said is quite true. Uh, What strikes me in this observation is that Jesus did not have to do this. He did not have to get personal. He did not have to start mingling, you know, kind of getting, getting mixed up in her personal life. He could have very easily said, we'll talk about living water, what you do on your own time is kind of up to you, but he doesn't seem to say that. And so this observation, I want to just look at the importance of boundaries. Just take a little bit of a, a look um, this, this point is my longest one in the message, so again, don't get freaked out if we're still on it in a few minutes, but just kind of bear with us. Observation number three, the importance of boundaries. The cultural ethic that we talked about in the beginning of sexual freedom without restraint or consequences, it seems as though Jesus is bringing into the light the reality that this idea of sexual freedom with no consequences is not true. It's a lie. In fact, he knows her heart. He knows where she is. He knows, in fact, she's ready for a good gospel conversation. And part of it is that she's been living in this illusion of freedom that isn't really freedom. The importance of boundaries. You know, there are certain churches, there are entire denominations that would say, you know what? They would really adopt or adjust how, and again, we're looking at the question, how do we adjust to a changing sexual ethic? They would say, well, maybe the best way to do it is just let your private life be your private life. Don't, don't worry about boundaries. Don't talk about that. Certainly don't preach about that. And don't force people into a dialogue that they probably don't want to have anyway. But here's where it's interesting. I was listening to an interview uh, just a couple weeks ago from a pastor And uh, the pastor's being interviewed on NPR, so it's a secular radio station, and they're talking about their church. They're doing some really neat things in their church. They're doing a lot of, like, helps ministries and helping people who are addicted and other things, feeding the hungry, some really good things that are coming out of that. So when the interviewer asks the pastor about belief, the pastor says, I don't care what our people believe. And even the interviewer was a little taken aback by that. Like, well, you're a church. I thought that's all you cared about was like belief sort of stuff. And the pastor said, no, I don't care about belief. We don't care about that. We don't worry about it. You believe what you want to believe and everything. So the interviewer is sort of trying to make sense of it. You can sort of hear her kind of processing it and says, okay, so you don't care what people believe. You just care about sort of how they behave. And the pastor said, we don't really care about that either. 
okay? This is what we call orthodoxy and orthopraxy, sort of right thinking, right action, and the church kind of focuses on a lot. So here's a church, a pastor, a leader, who's saying our response to the changing sexual ethic, and some of it was sexual, some of it was other, is we just don't, we don't really care. Now here's where it got very interesting. As the interview continued to go along, the pastor began to talk about the help that they do for, for survivors of sexual abuse. And I don't know if the pastor put this together, and I don't think the interviewer put this together, but I'm sitting on the other end listening to this and say, but isn't that an issue of belief and practice? Like if that person that is an abuser came to your church wouldn't you have a lot that you would want to say? Wouldn't you want to sit them down and say, we need to talk about belief, and we really need to talk about practice? And you might not use the words orthodoxy and orthopraxy, but you'd be preaching it. And so I think what it reveals is the boundaries are already there. This is part of the demystifying. This is part of undoing the myth. And I think Jesus is touching on this a little bit because while the secular culture says, I've got freedom, I don't have boundaries, you have freedom. You do whatever you want. The reality is that the boundaries are there. We see it all the time. Have you watched the electoral uh, process kind of unfold with this election happening? Think about the accusations that one candidate levels against another. They are all moral. This person is not being ethical. This person is not telling the truth. This person is not showing integrity. This person is sexist. This, I mean, these are the arguments that are being leveled. What are they doing? They're drawing lines, and the lines are moral. The lines are there. And so what I'd like to do in this, in this section is just talk about this reality. If you can follow me on this, if I haven't lost you so far, we do have lines. We do have boundaries. When a church says, I don't care what you believe, we don't have to discuss that. I don't care how you think, how you act, how you, any, all that. You know what I think you're left with? I think you're left with the Second Timothy church where Paul says they have a form of godliness but denying its power. You see, the power of the gospel, Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of the salvation of God to those who believe. And when I understand that there are boundaries and that I may be outside of those boundaries and I may be in need of a loving Savior to bring me back into right standing with God, now I'm standing in a place of power. Now I'm standing in a place of understanding. The boundaries are so important. So if you can give me that argument, let me ask you just to consider this. We'll take a few more minutes on this, on this point and then we're going to move through the other ones pretty quickly. If it's important enough to Jesus that boundaries matter, and if we're drawing lines anyway, and I'm making the assertion that we are, even if you're a secular person, not a person of faith, you're drawing moral lines. You might just not be drawing them in the same place. If we're drawing lines anyway, let's endeavor as the ecclesia, as the called out ones, as the church that bear the name of our Lord, let's endeavor to draw lines that reflect his priority, and thereby honor our good king. So let, let's step on a couple toes then. Let, let's just talk honestly. I think one of the things we, we don't do well in the church, and I, I grew up in an evangelical church, and so many of you, you did, and so you know, well, don't do this, and you shouldn't do this, and you shouldn't do this, and maybe it was just well because God said it, and I can show you the verse where he said it, but we don't always understand why. And we may not fully understand why. That doesn't preclude, you know, knowing why doesn't always mean uh, what we have to have in order to be obedient to Christ. I think we can honor him even when we don't know why. But we've got to talk about why. Why is, is premarital sex an issue? This is not a new issue. The church has been grappling with this and wrestling with this and fretting over this for decades, right? Why is premarital sex an issue? If I could sit down with a young person and if I could help them understand, I might say to them something, something like this. If the biblical ethic for sexuality promises that sex is actually something of incredible value, incredible value, what I would encourage you to do is to cherish that. When you spread something out so much, you simply devalue it, just like currency. If sex is the currency, you know, promiscuity is the devaluation of that currency. So then we find ourselves finding people saying, why, why isn't this kind of meeting the need that I hoped it would? Or why can't I get what I was hoping I would get out? Is because you've devalued something that God had intended to be valuable. I would call that a secondary issue, but I talk about that issue of inflation 
when we talk about pornography, why, why is that such a big deal? You know, I look at something in the privacy of my own home. I'm not hurting anybody. I'm not doing anything. It's, it's amazing. I would, I would sit down with somebody and I would say, can we talk about the issue of toxicity? When you have the state of Utah, this year this happened. This is unprecedented. The state of Utah puts out a national crisis emergency and basically says, we need help we have a public health crisis and is pleading with businesses and educators to protect children from pornography. Why is that? Because they're seeing the dysfunction that comes. You know, Time Magazine recently ran a cover story on pornography, uh, talking about the connection between pornography and sexual dysfunction, call it the Coolidge effect. So you've got like these young men who are basically saying, I, I don't know how to have a normal sexual relationship. I'm unable anymore to be aroused in the context of a one-on-one -on -one situation because I'm so used, to, I'm so conditioned to finding something new that I don't know what to do sexually with somebody that I've been with before. Strange. Tragic, really. Seeing the connections uh, in that same article between pornography and depression and drug and alcohol and consumption, the marital issues, I mean, I, we don't have to go into that. That's pretty obvious, right? You know, but listen, doesn't it make sense if somebody says, you know what, I'm, I'm trying to search for these things, I'm looking for these heart needs, and so I'll look for it wherever I can find it. And so to, to come to the end of that and the disappointment that happens when you realize I'm still not fulfilled. I'm still me. I'm still kind of where I was when I started this journey. So pornography is, is a big issue. Uh, cohabitation, I almost made this whole message about uh, talking about the, the issue of cohabitation and answering the question, you know, is it okay to, to, get, uh, to move in with somebody before you're married? Uh, if, if premarital sex was sort of be an issue of inflation and pornography be an issue of toxicity, um, I would challenge the person that maybe is thinking, well, you know, maybe we should live in, move in together and live together. We're going to get married anyway or we want to, so, so why not? I would challenge you to think about the issue of stability. Again, this is fascinating. Cohabitation in the last 50 years has increased 1,500%. So most people, the verdict is in to say, hey, of course you should live with somebody before you get married. How else are you going to know if you're sexually compatible? How else are you going to know if you get along or whatever? But then interestingly, a, a recent New York Times article uh, was reporting the fact that uh, people who are living together aren't staying happily married. In fact, they're divorcing at a higher rate, and that sort of seems counterintuitive. Why would that be happening? Well, again, this is where to have the dialogue, and I, I want to pause on this for a second and tell you why I think the dialogue is important. Okay, outside culture is looking at the church and saying, why are you so uptight? Why do you care? Who do you care? Why do you care who lives with who and everything else? It's a valid question. If you are part of the ecclesia and maybe an established part, maybe you've been here for a long time, decades, and you know living, to pe living with somebody outside of marriage is wrong and you shouldn't do it and everything else. Okay, I just want to challenge you on this for a second. Put yourself in the place of the person that very likely could be right here in this room who is uh, moving, moved in with their boyfriend or girlfriend. They're living together. They're kind of doing their thing. And then somewhere along the line, one of them says, you know what, why don't we check out, we should go to church. We should go to church. We've never done that. That's not been really part of our life. I, I'd, like to, I'd like to sort of explore that. And so you come to church, and now I'm going to stand up here and be like, uh-huh. I know what you're doing, living in sin at the Holiday Inn. Mm-hmm, point. Okay, think about it for a second. What makes some of these issues challenging is that we've got to balance our missional call. See, do you love that couple enough to walk alongside them and say, yeah, let, let's have some dialogue about it. I would love to have that dialogue. I would love to sit down with you. If you're thinking about moving in with your boyfriend or girlfriend or maybe you're living together now and say, I'd love to talk with you about that. And that's not a judgmental thing. I have not seen that yet in Jesus' interaction with this woman. He doesn't break out the shame card. He's not trying to pressure her or whatever. He's just trying to say, you know what, I think there's a wiser way. I think there's a different way. And I think it would speak to the heart issues that you're trying to figure out in ways that aren't ultimately going to fulfill you. So now even secular research is telling us living together actually sort of puts you at a disadvantage for long-term ha happiness. I would also add to it this. Uh, I've never had anybody uh, answer this in the negative. When I have said to a married couple, a going-to-be-married couple, or a couple that's living together, because I've had a lot of dialogue with people in different, different settings, when I've asked them the question, do you think when you are married it is important to have faithfulness, to have patience, 
to have self-control. These are three fruits of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Every time people have said, you want to guess? Sure it is. Of course it is. We're smart. We know this. We want to be patient. We want to have self-control. We want to have faithfulness. I can't have a happy marriage without those kind of things. I think that's going to, they're going to be very important. So to the couple that is living together and says, we don't need the covenant of marriage. We can just sort of live in this way. How do you know? How do you know? And I'm not saying that accusationally. I'm saying like you, you have to find a way to show to that person that you're going to lock arms with and do life with and go through all of this stuff together. So like when, when my wife and I work through things and I have to ask the question, yeah, but is she self-controlled? Yeah, but is she faithful? Does she really prioritize God first? You know why? The reason I know my wife will be faithful to me is because she was faithful with me. See what I mean? Don't underestimate that wonderful season of waiting. And yeah, it might be hard. And you might make some mistakes. And all of that kind of stuff. None of that is precluded in the gospel. Okay? There's all kinds of forgiveness and grace. And we're going to talk about that in a second. So don't let me lose you on this very kind of long point. But I would love for someone to, to, to really grapple with and wrestle with some of those questions. We have untested fruits Finally, I would say this. Um, well, I think cohabitation of all these things that I'm listing here, and we could look at a lot. I'm not going to do any more right now. Um, is what I would call kind of the, at least the honorable choice. You know, people saying, you know, I want to try to make this right. I want to try to do. What we would love to see is for you to succeed. What we would love to. See, what I would love to see as a pastor is you not back in my office six years down the road, pointing fingers at each other and saying you hate each other because you never started with a good foundation. And if you can hear that, I think it takes away some of the stigma of you're just trying to tell me how to live or what to do. So, um, the importance of boundaries. The last thing I'll say about that, and then I promise I will be brief with our last points, is this. Uh, For all of these subjects that I've just talked about, pornography, um, premarital sex, cohabitation, one of the key ingredients that is missing from all three of them that is not missing in the context of a covenant marriage is the covenant marriage renewal. When we started this series by talking about covenant marriage, here's one of the awesome things that can happen there, that, in, that sex in a covenant marriage in a way that it can't in any of these other circumstances that I'm talking about. It just isn't designed to do it. In a covenant marriage, it actually becomes, uh, Tim Keller makes this argument, a covenant renewal. Just in the same way that every month, what do we do? We come back to the communion table to renew the covenant that God has made with us, his ecclesia, his people, and forgiveness. We don't get saved again. We remember, though, his sacrifice for us. We sort of rekindle our love for him. So in the context of marriage as God designed it, you actually have this covenant renewal of sex. It's the place where, once again, you are literally naked and vulnerable and giving yourself to the other. And that's something you, it's just not equipped to do in these other settings. So it actually becomes something really very beautiful. And if any of you is trying to come up with a good uh, line for your wife to say, hey, honey, when's the last time we had a really good covenant renewal time? <laughs> that's your business. I'll leave that up to you. Doesn't sound like a good line to me, but okay. So the, the boundaries are. I think when we understand it, it really becomes something very special. Um, I'm going to wrap up with the last two observations. I'm going to do them sort of quickly. Number number four is uh, the, the gift of conviction. We start to see something happen in this woman when she is encountering Jesus. She says, sir, the woman said, this is verse 19, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim the place where we must worship is Jerusalem. And then all of a sudden, they're having this conversation about worship. So you see what Jesus has so masterfully done. He doesn't start with behavior modification, but he doesn't leave boundaries alone. But when conviction comes to the place of kind of the question of boundaries, now they're talking about worship. Now they're talking about sort of a reordered life. Now we're talking about something that's amazing. So I would simply suggest this. And if you're feeling any level of conviction or some of these subjects are a little hard to hear, just, I want you to now start to be encouraged by this. Conviction is a gift. 
Conviction is a gift. It precedes true conversion. It precedes change. It precedes a new mission. It precedes reordered worship. This, it's wild because we have this inverted sense of purity, right? So we think about purity from a secular standpoint of like you're sort of burn, born pure and then you make some bad decisions or choices in your life and you kind of maybe make a mess of some things. In, in the gospel, and that's why this message is called the gospel and the sexual atheist, look how beautiful this is. The gospel meets us at the mess and then Jesus begins to make us pure. It actually works in reverse of kind of the sexual understanding of purity. We can come to Christ how we are. So there's this gift of conviction. There's another really important piece that we have to get this if some of the future messages are going to make any sense. What we see Jesus practicing is not affirmational inclusion. This is a phraseology that uh, Dr. Michael Brown uses. It's really fascinating stuff. He's not practicing affirmational inclusion. He's not saying, oh, sure, you just kind of be where you are and everything. He's practicing transformational inclusion. He's saying, I love you right where you are, but there's a transforming thing that happens. Again, we don't have a form of godliness but denying its power. We embrace the work that Jesus wants to do. If you want affirmational inclusion, go to your great-grandma's house. She's probably going to love you no matter what you do. You can be the biggest jerk you want. If you want transformational inclusion, come to Jesus. If you want transformational inclusion, inclusion, let the ecclesia let the church on mission, let this be a place that we can work this stuff out without shame, without, without guilt or whatever, but to say, you know what, I need to be transformed. That is the power of the gospel. I'm not just fine. You're not just fine. If we can get our minds around that, we're on a whole new path, and that's where this woman finds herself. So number four is a gift of conviction. Observation number five is this encounter with Jesus that she didn't even realize she was having until now. Verse 25, the woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, am he. She has an encounter with Jesus that is literally transformative in her life. This woman now all of a sudden is on a whole new mission. She goes out, if you read the rest of the story, and she's now telling people, hey, come tell me the, come see the person who told me everything I ever did. You know what I mean? So instead of the shame, she's now transformed. And now listen to this, because this is really important for us, that she's still a, a work in progress, right? But it's not by her self-effort. It's not by her shame. It's not by institutional pressure. It's not a form of godliness but denying his power. It's an encounter with Jesus. So if any of these subjects, if you say, you know what, I've really kind of embraced unwittingly or maybe wittingly, maybe knowingly, I've embraced much more of a secular form of sexuality than I have a sacred one. Maybe I'm guilty. I've been a sexual atheist. I've been assuming that God has nothing to say. If that brings some level of conviction, I would like this to bring a lot of hope. Jesus did not slap a purity ring on her before he sent her out on mission. She just went as a work in progress to be able to say, come meet the man who told me everything I ever did. Listen, don't miss this. All of a sudden, the weakness, all of a sudden the place that if we get it wrong becomes a place of shame, it becomes a place of scorn, the weakness now becomes the platform for her ministry. Do you understand that? Do you see what God is doing in this redemptive act? It's absolutely glorious and it's absolutely beautiful. So those are my five observations. I'd like to conclude with this. And thank you for bearing with, because I know this is a little bit of a longer message, so thanks for hanging in there. But let's, let's just conclude with this. We asked the question originally, how should the church respond to a changing sexual ethic? There's a whole culture that would look at a lot of what I'm saying here and just say, no, I'm not interested in that. Should the church kind of bend? Should we change? Should we say, well, you know, maybe we do need to be more like that pastor that was interviewed and just say, it doesn't really matter what you believe, just do it in your private life. I was reading an interesting article by Trevin Wax, and uh, what a cool name, right? Uh, he brings up a point, he says, you know, th this is not the first time in, in history that the church has had to make some significant choices of kind of where do you draw those lines and what do you uphold and what do you go after, and I hope we're doing a gracious job of doing that today. Um, but he said, you know, it's interesting, when you look back 100 years, the issue of the day uh, was, was modernism. It was scientific discovery. 
and that made the church seem sort of antiquated with, with people saying, you know, belief in miracles and things like that. Um, so a lot of churches started saying at that time, you know, I think we really need to adapt our belief. We need to adapt our behavior. We need to think and talk differently so that we can be more, uh, more accessible to the people. Here's what he writes. He says, as this adaptation spread, belief in the bodily resurrection of Jesus was reinterpreted and given a solely spiritual meaning. He's alive in the hearts of good people. Uh, miracle stories such as Jesus' feeding of the 5,000 were given a moral twist. Well, the true miracle is that suddenly everyone shared. Yay. Uh, things like the virgin birth were just sort of dismissed altogether. It's fascinating because the churches that went this route almost immediately began to decline. Even though it was much more popular, uh, they began sort of a new uh, phase of decline that for many of them, if they're still around, has continued today. The Presbyterian minister and theologian, John Grisham Machen, he said this. Uh, he made the case that this was a refashioning of Christianity, and it was no longer Christianity now at all, but a substitute religion with a Christian veneer. Now here's an interesting point, and then we'll conclude. Traditional stalwarts like Machen and J.K. J., uh, Chesterton who were criticized as hopelessly backward back then. I mean, granted, if, if you go the traditional biblical route of a sexual ethic, there's going to be tons of people that are like, what is wrong with you? Seriously. Hopelessly backward they were seen, but they're the ones that still have books in print. The names of their most once fashionable opponents are almost all but unrecognizable. And here was the point, and I think if we can take this with us, we're on our way in a good direction. The churches that thrived were those that offered something more than the echo of their times. The question is a great one to wrestle with. How should the church respond to a changing sexual ethic? I think we can learn something from this. And may God let this be a place and places like this be a kind of place where people can actually get something other than the echo of the times, something more and something greater. I want to pray for you, um, but as I, as I do that and as we close, worship team can come up here in just a moment uh, and do that. But let, let me give you just a, one or two practical thoughts. Number one, uh, if in, in listening to a message like this, uh, the response in your heart is one of like, man, what do I do? We always have the option, always have the option in every circumstance to respond in repentance and to receive grace. So let that be a reality as part of the ecclesia. We always have the encouragement to pursue accountability. You will be the biggest factor in your pursuit of sexual purity and upholding a sexual uh, biblical ethic. So pursue accountability. That might mean that you need to have a conversation this week. You may need to bring somebody in on your team and into the mix. I have lots of people that I've walked with uh, over the years who have said, you know what, I really got some areas that I want to get some accountability as iron sharpens iron. Uh, I want to I want to I want to breathe courage over you today. You know that as we pray to realize that you're not alone that this whole encounter with Jesus you don't need behavior modification you need a greater sense of the presence of Christ in your life. When that happened in this woman's life it was a total revolution in her heart and that's what you need more than behavior modification. So I want to encourage you with all those things I want to pray for you and then we'll wrap up. God thanks for the work that you uh, love to do, and even when it makes us uncomfortable, may we be a kind of people who say, yes, we invite the hard questions. We invite the, the shining light of the gospel because when we do that, we also invite the grace and the goodness and the forgiveness and everything that we need for life and godliness. So I pray, Father, for the ecclesia represented here that you would stir us up shake us up, wake us up and let us be responsive to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.